I'm all ready. Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> what a classical. But where to start? We're gonna start with a coffee, of course, but what was first? The bad organization of Real Madrid in the pressure high and their decision to pressure high when actually they're not made for that. Or the confidence of Barcelona building from the back and passing passing the ball around Real Madrid. It was a mixture of both, wasn't it? Anyway, one thing that I cannot function with at this time of the morning is uh, we have coffee. So first things first. Puedo pediros un café con leche? Disaster. <laughs> that wasn't the best walking with a coffee that I've ever done, but never mind. So it all starts with the lineups and the decisions that the coaches make. Obviously, for Barcelona, the doubt was who were going to play up front, and Xavi went with everything. Everything in the sense that uh, there was no thinking of an extra midfielder. Uh, if there was a work to do, getting close to the midfielders with the build that under pressure, it will have to be done by forwards. So Ferran Torres on the left-hand side, Dembélé on the right-hand side, and of course Aubameyang, who ended up scoring two goals. The midfield, uh, as per usual, with the young, with Pedri, and with uh, with Busquets. And again, at the back was the biggest surprise. Araujo was played there on the right-hand side instead of Dani Alves for security reasons, for defensive reasons, because Barcelona had identified that on that side, the right-hand side of their defense, was the main danger of Real Madrid that was going to accumulate a lot of talent. In theory, it was going to be Vinicius there, Cross and Modric, who, as I'm about to explain, was used in a different role, further up the field. So Araujo obviously needed, uh, was going to need help, but in any case, it was preferred because he's fast, uh, because he is a defender first and foremost. In that way, Barcelona lost one extra midfielder, one attacked, because uh, Dani Alves does get inside, it gets close to, um, to Busquets. It was a confident Barcelona, one that had put so much work in recent times that quite clearly, and the Xavi, that quite clearly everybody started thinking the same way. But I felt, I always felt, every team has got a moment in which it got like click and everything works. Was it gonna be at the Bernabeu? There was never really an indication that this was going to be the one. If you look at the entourage, it was more about, let's see, let's see what's inside this Pandora box. For Real Madrid, with the absence of Benzema, it was all about how was he going to be replaced. And from the changing room, a story came out in the last hour before the game. Modric is playing, so is Valverde, but it's not going to be 4-4-2, or it's not going to be the 4-4-2 that we all thought, with Valverde uh, in the midfield and uh, and Modric as well, close to Cross and Casemiro. It was actually going to be a diamond-shaped midfield. Valverde deeper with next to cross if you like Modric in the diamond shape the one further up the field just behind Vinicius and Rodrigo false nine that's how it was described by players did they prepare that well one thing is to talk about it and I know that Ancelotti has said many times that uh, actually he doesn't need to give many instructions to cross or Modric because they know how to adapt to whatever the game requires another one is to actually adjust the team for pressure yes with the ball of course Modric in the first few minutes, sometimes he dropped very deep because uh, Barcelona had put a very good, started with a very good pressure high. Ramadi couldn't come out of it, so Modric adapted and went deeper and linked up a little bit better. Two or three times he did it, and then Ramadi could come out of that pressure. But most of the time, he was waiting further up the field because that's where he had to put the pressure. He had to pressure the uh, centre back as he was in the middle of the attack and in a line of three, if you like, when they were defending with Rodrigo and Vinicius trying to stop the first passes of Barcelona in the build-up. That was not prepared. That was awfully done and that was one of the main reasons why Real Madrid just could not stop Barcelona. So Modric will run to the player with the ball if he was the centre-back. He arrived late with Rodrigo and Vinicius going to the players closer to them as well for the pressure. That was not followed by the midfield, big gaps. It was easy for Barcelona to find the, uh, the superiority. Yes, there were a point where it was four before at the back, but there was always somebody free and it was easy to find them. With a pass from Ter Stegen, quick pass to uh, Busquets, and then just releasing it to right or left, there was always somebody free. The adjustment of the pressure was awful. And with that, things started happening in the mind of players. Barcelona felt much more confident. Of course, when they beat that badly organized pressure, what happened straight away 
is that with the pace of our Mayam, especially Dembélé, with the mental quickness of uh, Pedri Oport and, and with the bravery of, uh, of uh, Ferran Torres, it was easy to find opportunities to score. That explains a lot. The pressure high of Barcelona was good, so Ramari had to release the ball early. The pressure high of Ramari was bad. Why did they decide to do pressure high? They're not made for the, to do that. They haven't got that kind of team. So uh, the dynamic from the beginning became very clear. What was amazing, in the minute 35, Ramari already 1-0 down. Ancelotti calls Modric and says, look, we're going to change this, this is not right. Minute 35, there was no time to apply it because there was a corner and Araujo scores the second goal of Barcelona, 2-0 down. But it made more sense, uh, the new formation that uh, Ancelotti had put in place with Valverde on the right-hand side, 4-4-2 now, with Rodrigo Mor in the middle, Vinicius on the left, and then Modric deeper with Cross and Casemiro. Uh, and then from there, they, they, they made a couple of moves with lots of passes. The idea will be to build from there, but no. In the second half, amazingly enough, Ancelotti decides to put a back three that were completely discoordinated. They just hadn't played together before. They, it wasn't ready. They weren't prepared for it. They didn't train it. And Ferran Torres had an amazing chance. 1v1 with the goalkeeper that he missed, but he didn't miss the second one. With 3-0 down, another change of formation with Alaba uh, on the left-hand side. I think Casemiro goes in the center of the uh, of the defense. Four at the back now, you know, Barcelona could have scored eight goals. In fact, Xavi at the end was annoyed the last 15, 20 minutes for Barcelona was about keeping possession and being conservative with possession. And he wanted more and more and more. It was a historic moment, but it was anyway a turning point. It is absolutely a turning point. Yes, Barcelona are here, are back. I do think that Ramari made him, made them look better, but the stats anyway, are much better. I think since Xavi arrived, if I'm not mistaken, it's too late for this season. I know some positive Barcelona fans think that is, you know, if Barcelona beats Rayo, the game ahead, which is possible, it'll be only nine points. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Real Madrid have to play Sevilla and Atletico Madrid, I think. Still, Real Madrid will have to drop a lot of points. We'll have to lose two games, draw one, for Barcelona to actually go ahead, something like that and uh, I just don't see it happening. But in any case, a very good foundation to build on for Barcelona. Hopefully they think that could convince Haaland to come to Barcelona with, for less money. Very quickly on Haaland, the story is, I published it on the BBC webpage. Uh, basically, he's given uh, everyone or has asked everyone to give him uh, 10 to two weeks time. Uh, it's not going to be a matter of money. Everybody puts more or less the same money on the table. It's going to be a matter of him staying at Borussia Dortmund. And if he does stay, the idea is to go to Barcelona, Madrid the season after, not City, or go to City, Barcelona, Madrid this season. Madrid would like him to come in a, in a year's time. Barcelona would like him to come now, but they realize that the finances will have to be right. That is, they can, they, they, they have said to Haaland what they want to pay, but they have to get rid of players to reduce the wage list and to uh, get money to the club to actually afford him. It's 350 million euros what he costs between commissions and transfer fee, 75 million euros, and uh, wages. It's a lot of money for Barcelona, um, and it will mortgage them a little bit. They think they need him, but at the same time, financially it will be difficult. And of course, City are saying, look, you are young, come to us, play two or three years. Look, Pep Guardiola is thinking of staying, partly because you're coming over. If you are coming over, um, City are confident that they can convince him to stay at least an extra two years. and. Then after you can go to Madrid or Barcelona. So everybody's waiting now, the decision of, of Haaland. Interesting that Michael Laudrup said that uh, it's not the striker Barcelona needs because he doesn't link up, he doesn't drop deep. Um, he needs space in front of him. That's uh, an interesting uh, analysis, which I fully understand. But in any case, they do need a goal scorer. Uh, over my younger done really well. I think he's eight goals in the eight games. So. Uh, no complaints with with Aurel Mayang, uh, but uh, they need somebody that can give them that kind of return for the next six to seven years. So we'll see. Darwin Nunez they like as well as well of uh, the uh, striker from Benfica who um, who has is having a great great season. Cost 25 million, I think it was from Almeria in the second division, the most expensive player in the history of the second division in Spain when he went to Benfica, and he now costs about 70 million. There's much more that I will tell you. I like to tell you, but I think uh, a lot have done this video long enough. Remember, there is uh, new episodes of the Pure Football Podcast and uh, more stuff that's uh, happening. But all the information you always have it on my Instagram, on my Twitter, and everything else. Now, time for my coffee. Bye bye.
by the way, I almost forgot. Soon you're gonna have the uh, second part of my trip of 10 days and 11 flights, or was it 11 days and 10 flights? Something like that. It's about to come out, it will come out tomorrow, and why don't you comment? If I ask you, do you think Barcelona has still got a chance to um, win the title? Do you think you say yes, a no, a maybe? I'd like to read your comments, so go on. Go on.